At Christmas time, Christians like me, despite the chaos of the shopping, the eating, the drinking, should really be celebrating the birth of Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin, the Saviour child sent to earth to save us all. The story we have been told for over 2,000 years that is supposed to be exclusive to Christianity. But what if I were to tell you that the story of Jesus wasn't quite as unique as you might have thought? That the Hindu god Krishna also had a miraculous birth and was also attended by angels and shepherds? This is the story of the child Krishna. But it could well be the story of Jesus. And that like Jesus, the Buddha also performed miracles, walking on water and feeding the 500. So, in some ways, I'm not just following Jesus, I'm also following Buddha. And that some are convinced that Jesus didn't die on the cross in Jerusalem, but is buried in India. So, this suggests that the tomb is the tomb of Jesus. This is where Jesus is buried and that there are others who believe Jesus had a very different life story and even see him as a symbol of oppression. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. Then there are the Muslims who believe Jesus will come back at the end of time and who even have a tomb awaiting him next to Mohammed's in Medina. And there is also an ancient Christian text that has lain hidden for over 1,600 years that has a very different version of Jesus' story. If there are so many different stories like Jesus's, which one is the real deal? I'm going to do what most Christians fear to do, go outside the Christian tradition on a journey from Jesus' traditional birthplace in Bethlehem to the foothills of the Himalayas, from ancient Egypt to modern-day India, to find out about these stories, investigate their origins, and uncover who Jesus really was. I began my search for the hidden Jesus in Vrindaban, one of India's holiest cities, and the center of worship for the ancient Hindu god Krishna. It's the month of Kartik, one of the most auspicious times of the Hindu year, when millions of pilgrims come here to worship Krishna. In ancient Hinduism, Krishna is seen as the supreme god who descends to earth to fight evil. The stories concerning his life go back 800 years before the birth of Jesus. I am here to explore the similarities between Jesus Christ and Krishna, and in particular, their birth stories. Srivatsa Goswami is a Brahmin priest who can trace his lineage back to the founders of this holy city more than 600 years ago. I tell you a story. The story of a wondrous birth where the child is born in the humblest settings the Mother Earth can provide. Every year, just like our nativity plays about the birth of Jesus, Hindus perform Ras Leelas, or religious passion plays about the birth of Krishna. In the story, there is an evil king who tries to prevent the coming of the child. In a prophecy, the evil king is told that a child will grow up to kill him. So he goes on a killing spree, murdering babies. It was beginning to sound familiar. In the story, the stars portends the birth. The crucial hour is the middle of the night. There is also an immaculate conception, and the birth is heralded by angels. While the evil king's guards sleep, the father is told to flee with his family. They have to cross a river, but the waters are miraculously parted. You might wonder, whose birth story is this? This is the story of the child Krishna. Not Jesus, Krishna. But 
it could well be the story of Jesus. The tyrant could be Herod, and then the details go on, you know. And as Jesus is heralded by John the Baptist, so Krishna is heralded by his elder brother Balram. And the same story, you know. So, so, so I mean, how, how, I mean, same story. I mean, this is absolutely amazing stuff because most Christians, yes. when they see the nativity every Christmas, uh, December, yes. they think this is unique. When I was a child at Sunday school, I was taught very little about other religions. Instead, I was told repeatedly that the Christian story of Jesus was totally unique and that there was only one way to salvation through him. Anything else was entertaining evil. Who's in this, uh, this shrine here? It is, it is also Lord Krishna when he become young. So that's Radha. Krishna as a young person yes. with his, his love. His, his Miss love. Radha. Miss, oh, right. To celebrate Krishna's birthday, just like we do at Christmas, Hindus also build nativity cribs. When I see images of the baby Jesus, often at yes. Christmas, yes. both of the cultures have scenes or images of their deity as a baby. Yeah. So in Christianity, you have Jesus in the crib, and he have Krishna in a swing yeah. with his mother pulling the swing. Yes. The more I looked at it, the more similarities I found between Krishna and Jesus. Flute. You have a flute. And the more I realized that Jesus' story may not be unique. Ah, oh, that's it, that's Krishna. Have you sold them always to Hindus or have Christians bought them? Have Muslims bought them? Yeah. Hindus buy them, Muslims buy them. What about Jesus? Does he think Jesus is the same as Krishna? Yes, they are the same. He is also an incarnation of God. Christians go on pilgrimages to places connected with the life story of Jesus, Hindus are encouraged to visit the holy sites connected with Lord Krishna and his many miracles. One of the holiest is Radhakund, where Hindus come to take ritual baths. I caught up with a group of Hare Krishna devotees, led by Dibandu Das. There are lots of similarities between the life of Jesus and the life of Krishna. Did you think they were similar in, in other ways? In part of India, the dialect, they say Krishna, Krista. Krista. And we know the Greek is Christos. So they're coming from the same root, actually. So not only are the birth stories of Krishna and Jesus very similar, in at least one Indian dialect, it seems that even their names sound the same. As Krishna says, every living being is my son, so in one sense, we're all sons of God. Jesus was an obedient son, so therefore he said, he's called the only son of God, because we're here because we're sinful. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's no question of sin for Jesus. He was, a, he was pure from his birth. Krishna is, loves us more than we, we can ever know, so he tries in different ways by sending different messengers, different gurus, any way, anyhow. He comes himself in various incarnations, mm -hmm. just in so many different ways, according to time and culture, he tries to bring us back. I was taught that throughout the Gospels, Jesus told his disciples to forsake all and follow me. Now I find it's just the same with the followers of Krishna. They also believe that by chanting Krishna's name over and over again, they will get closer to him. When I recite Christianity's most famous prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, the very second line is, hallowed be thy name. It's almost exactly the same idea. As a Christian, I've been surprised at the many similarities I've found between Krishna and Jesus. But most Christian fundamentalists 
still refuse to accept that they can learn anything from or have anything in common with any other religion. I, like many Christians in the West, mm. went to Sunday school, mm. went to church, mm. and was frankly taught to be intolerant towards other religions. And when we were taught about Hinduism and the many gods, we were actually taught to see these gods as idols. And Krishna, rather than being a manifestation of the divine, mm. was an idol. A fourth century poet, uh, talking to God, whoever the God is, the Guru or the God, he says uh, there are innumerable ways to reach you. As all the rivers, straight or crooked, uh, meet the ocean, so, oh my Lord, all these various ways uh, somehow take us there. So if you have that spiritual humility, to not denounce the other roads out of existence, other ways of out of existence, and cling to your own road, you will reach there. If we could learn to find unity in these common spiritual values, things that aren't unique to Jesus, then it would make things like Christian fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, even Hindu fundamentalism that attempts to separate people, sure. it would make it even more of a nonsense than it actually is. One of the opening prayers of Rig Veda, it says, Ano bhadraha kritvo yantu vishwataha. Let noble ideas and thoughts come to me from all over the world. Mm. Unless we keep our doors open, mm. the humanity is going to be poorer and poorer. Yeah. But the factors which are responsible for that are political and economic factors. Yeah, yeah. If we don't have the logic of love as a driving force behind politics and economy, mm. the future of religion is very bleak, it's bleak it's very bleak. bleak. At a key moment in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples, other sheep have I which are not of this fold. I believe he was telling them and us that there are other ways to God just as valid as Christianity. And from what I've seen here in India, there are lots of points of connection between Hinduism and Christianity, between Jesus and Krishna. And Hindus have no problem understanding Jesus and accepting his teachings. My last night in Vrindavan was the culmination of the Hindu holiday of Diwali, or the Festival of Light. Traditionally, everyone lights lamps or candles to signify the victory of light over darkness, good over evil. Hindus believe that there is something inside all of us which is pure, infinite and eternal. So just as Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas, Hindus have Diwali, a celebration of this inner light, the knowing of which will banish all darkness, all ignorance. But what worries me is that many Christians still have a big problem with Hinduism and think that worshipping Krishna is plain wrong. For me, this is not the right attitude. The real Jesus didn't just want people to become Christians, but for everyone to experience the kingdom of God by whatever means is best for them. We've already heard of the remarkable similarities between the life stories of Krishna and of Jesus. But here in India, there's another important religious figure, also the result of miraculous birth, who was tempted by the devil before beginning his public ministry at the age of 30, 
who performed miracles such as walking on water and the feeding of 500, and who challenged the established religious order and presented an alternative way of understanding the world, and who spread his teachings and wisdom through parables and sayings. Now, it all sounds extraordinarily familiar, but I'm not talking about Jesus, but of Prince Sudhartha Gautama, or Buddha. I am now in northern India, in the foothills of the Himalayas. After the Chinese invasion of Tibet in 1950, this area became the spiritual home of Tibetan Buddhism. In my search for the hidden story of Jesus, I have come here to investigate the similarities between Jesus and Buddha. More than 400 years before Jesus appeared in Palestine, Prince Siddhartha Gautama was born, the only son of a local king. According to tradition, his mother, Maya, gave birth to him miraculously. Like Jesus, he was also predicted to become a great man from birth, and wise men traveled to see him. As Siddhartha neared his 30th birthday, he began to realize the world was full of pain and suffering. So he decided to leave home and take up the life of a wandering monk. For the next six years, he meditated on the sufferings of the world. Like Jesus, he was also tempted by a devil figure, but resisted. Finally, one day, while sitting under a tree, he found enlightenment and began his ministry to teach the world about Dharma, or the right way of living. Today, Buddhism has spread all over the world and has over 300 million followers. I had arranged to meet Thai Situ Rinpoche, the 12th reincarnation of a Buddhist Lama or spiritual master, who can trace his lineage back to one of Prince Siddhartha's original disciples. Buddha, as we know, was born miraculously, and we know that he, like Jesus, uh, was tempted by the devil. Uh, we know that he performed miracles, um, and there are some miracles which are very similar to the miracles of Jesus, um, walking on water. We know that Jesus' life, he challenges the religious order, and so does Buddha. So, I mean, how do you understand the similarities that there are in their lives, just in the lives and the way that they're mapped out? Well, uh, uh, I, this is interesting because uh, on earth you cannot find one person who don't like to be happy and who like to suffer. You cannot find one. Everybody likes to be happy. Everybody don't want to suffer. So the teaching of Buddha is based on that. The teaching of Christ is based on that. And uh, why? I think is because both of them are humans. Right. right. But a uh, good thing is uh, if you are following uh, pure uh, Christian uh, lineage, then uh, uh, you are uh, following the path already. In the New Testament, in John's Gospel, Jesus taught that I am the way, the truth, and the life and that by following him, you can enter the kingdom of God. Buddha taught that if you follow his path and lead a moral life, are mindful of your thoughts and actions, and develop wisdom and compassion, you could reach enlightenment too. In their teachings, both Jesus and Buddha provide a very practical guide to personal transformation that is remarkably similar. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Consider others as yourself. Professor Duncan Durrett has been studying Buddhism for the past 50 years. Any Buddhist hearing the Sermon on the Mount would immediately say to himself, here is the teaching of our Buddha, for sure. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other also. If anyone should give you a blow with his hand, with a stick or with a knife, 
you should abandon any desires and utter no evil words. The Buddha and Jesus were attempting to achieve the same object, that an individual could be shown how to be righteous. Righteousness is a technical term amongst the Jews and amongst Christians. A righteous person will always look out for his duty to his neighbor. And the Buddha, on the other hand, is looking for what was called dharma, and that can also be translated righteousness. He wanted the individual to have a model, uh, somebody who has got rid of anything which stands in the way of his being a perfect man. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. From anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Hatreds do not ever cease in this world by hating, but by love. This is an eternal truth. Overcome anger by love. Overcome evil by good. Overcome the miser by giving. Overcome the liar by truth. The Buddhists think that there is a continuum of life, and by perfecting oneself, one reaches a stage where one is not reborn and suffers no more. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, which exists on the earth, amongst those who are real subjects of the real king, that is God himself. These teachings are very similar, and the Buddhist would understand the, the Christian, and vice versa. There's so much similarity, even in that aspect, in Buddhism and Christianity, because I spent times in monasteries, and they use incense, mm. and they use uh, rosary, and also they use the folding the hand during the prayer. And also we have uh, a double doji, the cross of the Vajra, and you have a cross. Uh, so these are a uh, lot of similarities are there. When you are following a path with one motivation to make everything better, make everyone free from suffering, and then regardless of how long it will take, we are all going into the same direction. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand, I yeah. understand. So as a Christian, when I look at the teachings of Buddha yes. and see the similarities, yes. in some ways, yes. I'm not just following Jesus, yes. I'm also following Buddha. Uh, well, uh, uh, I can respect that, I can respect that, but I cannot speak for you. Mm. You, 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 yeah, you, have, you have, you have spoken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Tibetan Buddhism, there is a type of holy figure known as a bodhisattva, someone who has put on full enlightenment so they can help others along the right path here on earth. Many Buddhists think Jesus was a bodhisattva. Before I left northern India, I wanted to meet one of Tibetan Buddhism's holiest leaders, the Gyama Kamapa, or the one who carries out the teachings of Buddha, the 17th reincarnation in a line stretching back over 800 years. I was granted a private audience. How would you explain Jesus as a Buddhist? Where would you place him? Jesus was undoubtedly a great holy being for the world, and from a Buddhist perspective, we can definitely recognize him as a holy being. When someone abandons his own self-interest for the benefit of others, we can call him a bodhisattva. Although Jesus wasn't a Buddhist, we can still call him a bodhisattva. One of the things that amazes me about the story of Jesus mm -hmm. and the story of Buddha mm -hmm. is the similarities in their teachings. Mm -hmm. Their thoughts or teachings are similar because their motivation is to guide others towards the right path. If we look back into history, the stories of these holy beings are always similar. 
Bena sangi jumden der chim bina sangi gi ene bena ji jigtome During Buddha Sakyamuni's time the caste system was extremely prevalent He worked very hard to undo the caste system and bring equality to all For example there were as many nuns as there were monks Jesus also brought about many similar changes, such as equality and justice. They both understood their society's problems and so challenged those dogmas. So what could be the cause of these similarities? At the time that the Bible was being written, we know that trade routes existed between India and Palestine via the Silk Road in the north and the sea in the south. And there are even Western historical accounts of travelers, diplomats and monks journeying from India to the Middle East. According to Indian sources, the Emperor Ashoka, who ruled most of India 250 years before Jesus was born, sent Buddhist missionaries all over Asia some may even have made it to Greece and Egypt. So there is a possibility that Buddhists and early Christians could have met and exchanged ideas. In the course of this missionary endeavor, Buddhists will have found their way to all the major centers of learning. And so lives of, of Buddha will have found their way to Alexandria, we can be sure of it. They were engaging in a common search for truth, not only to find the truth, but how individuals might achieve it, whatever their backgrounds. So you may say there was a two-way exchange. Yes, it is very possible. We have stories where sailors and soldiers who went on campaigns took Buddhist teachings with them. Some believe, and I have been informed, how during Jesus' lost years, he came to India at the peak of Buddhism. He was impressed by the teaching and took it back with him. So yes, it is very possible. And as Buddhism developed, the uh, representatives of the Buddha said that there are Buddhas in other lands. And when the story of Jesus is told and how he knowingly and deliberately flung his life away to show the result of his teaching, there we are, there's a Buddha. Whether Buddhists and Christians did meet or not, the similarities between the teachings of Jesus and Buddha are remarkable. But many Christians still find it easy to reject this as they are thousands of miles and hundreds of years away from each other. One of London's most famous landmarks, St. Paul's Cathedral, is dedicated to Christianity's first theologian and, after Jesus himself, arguably its true founder, the Apostle Paul. It was Paul who first took Christianity out of its Jewish-Palestinian setting and transformed it into a world-beater. It was Paul and his followers who created much of the Christianity we know today. A religion of salvation by faith in Jesus, a pre-existent divine being sent to earth by God to save us all from our sins. Much of the dogma that surrounds Jesus was created by Paul. Paul describes himself as the apostle to the Gentiles, or as we'd know them today, pagans. Paul was supremely practical in terms of converting non-believers. And he even admits in his letter to the Corinthians, I have become all things to all people that I might win them to Christ. And what he meant by that was that he was willing to adapt and adjust himself to whatever circumstances he found himself. And if that meant a little bit of borrowing from pagan religion, then so be it. My search for the hidden Jesus has now brought me to the north of England, to the border of the Roman Empire, Hadrian's Wall. 
Just after the Second World War, there was an incredible series of archaeological discoveries in the UK. They revealed a network of Roman temples from London in the south to Hadrian's Wall in the north. They were dedicated to a pagan religion that existed at the same time as Christianity and to a god who had striking similarities to Jesus, Mithras. Lindsay Allison Jones is the director of the Museum of Antiquities at the University of Newcastle and an expert in the mystery cult of Mithras. Oh, wow, this looks really well preserved. It is, isn't it? Yes. Now, what could I have expected to see if it was uh, in its original condition? You probably wouldn't have seen very much at all because it was sunk right down. The worshippers of Mithras um, were trying to reconstruct, um, in a sense, the original cave of Mithras. So they wanted it dark, they wanted it subterranean. This would have been doorway. You would have gone in through here. You would then come in through here into the actual temple itself. Um, and you'd see in front of you the three altars there. And behind that, there would be a large relief showing Mithras killing the primeval bull. That was the act of creation for the worshippers of Mithras. May he bring us help. May he bring us comfort. May he bring us joy. He, the awful and overpowering, worthy of sacrifice and prayer. Mithra, the lord of wide pastures. And Mithras is a god to the good side, I presume, the, Myth, the light. Yes, Mithras was the lord of light. That He was basically attached to the sun god who ordered Mithras to go and kill the primeval bull to release life force for the benefit of mankind. Mm, that's interesting symbolism there. Yes. So you've got this powerful deity and then this kind of sub-deity who acts as a, ki a kind of saviour yes. figure for humankind. The rise of Mithras almost exactly parallels the rise of Jesus although his origins could be much more ancient. Some say he was created by the Romans, others that he came from Persia and India. Mithras was, a, was seen as a saviour god. He was unusual amongst the gods in that you weren't really trying to bribe him in quite the same way that they were trying to bribe some of the other deities um, to make sure that you were, your life on earth was as comfortable as possible. Um, Mithras was rare in that he actually offered you a life after death. So if Mithras predated Jesus and is also a saviour god who offered his followers a life after death, did Christianity steal these ideas? It was a mystery cult. Um, we certainly know that they were having ritual meals. It seems to have been a fairly basic feast, based largely on the chickens, mm. on bread and on wine. Bread and wine. Bread and wine, yes. I mean, you know, it's got similarities with early Christianity, the sense of feasting, um, the sense of discipline. You don't have to appease the deity. You work at things for your own mm -hmm. good. Um, there's a deity who is a, a god of light who is sent by a major deity to um, kill his nemesis in mm -hmm. order to redeem and save the world. Yes, the early Christian fathers who wrote a lot were very upset about Mithraism. They thought that Mithraism was parodying Christianity. This so infuriated many early Christians that they felt they had to publicly denounce Mithras and his worshippers. One fourth century Christian writer, Ambrosiaster, tried to demonize their secret rituals. What travesty is it then that they enact in the cave with veiled faces? For they cover their eyes, lest their deeds of shame should revolt them. Some, like birds, flap their wings, imitating the raven's cry. Others roar like lions. Others bind their hands with the entrails of fowls and fling themselves down over pits full of water. What shameful mockeries for men who call themselves wise. Another early church father, Justin Martyr, tried to claim it was Mithras who was copying Jesus. Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, this do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body. And having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, this is my blood, and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras. The problem for Christians was that the similarities did not stop there. One tradition claims Mithras even had a virgin birth. 
Mithras, there were two stories, one that he was born from the living rock and the other that he was born from the cosmic egg. So there is potentially a crossing of ideas and even potentially a merging of ideas between Mithras and early Christianity. Potentially. Uh, there is even a story that uh, Mithras's birth was witnessed by shepherds watching their sheep, but that again is a much later story and you don't know whether at this point Christianity and Mithraism is all getting rather intertwined and it's getting confused. Mithras was a pagan god with a story, a purpose, and elements of ritual very similar to that of Jesus, but one whose origins could predate him by thousands of years. But the fact is that Mithraism failed to survive, and it was Christianity that conquered the Roman Empire. But we do know that early Christian fathers were very worried about the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism, especially the charge that Christianity borrowed many of its ideas from this pagan cult. So when paganism was officially outlawed, particular animosity was shown towards Mithraism. Many of its temples were destroyed and others had churches built on top of them. But Mithraism did leave one mark on Christianity. When later church fathers were deciding what anniversary to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, they chose December the 25th, the winter solstice, which also happens to be the birthday of Mithras. I had been told that there was another place, one of the key locations for early Christianity, where the similarities between Jesus and other pagan gods are even more obvious, Egypt. Christianity came very early to Egypt. One tradition claims it arrived just 30 years after Jesus' death. It has also always puzzled scholars why Christianity took hold so easily here. One theory claims it was because of its many parallels with ancient Egyptian religious ideas and rituals. <laughs> Egyptologist Dr. Boyana Moisov is an expert in the ancient cult of Osiris. Boyana, she claims it has uncanny similarities to Christianity and the story of Jesus. I met her in Abydos, in Upper Egypt, at the 3,300-year-old temple dedicated to the cult of Osiris. Can you tell me what happened here? Well, once a year there was a festival of Osiris, and the myth of Osiris is the most ancient myth of Egypt. The festival lasted for about a week and reached its culmination on the last three days. And um, on the first of those three days, the earth body of Osiris would be buried. During the second day, vigils in the temple were said um, for the God's resurrection. And then on the morning of the third day, the statue was brought out into the court through here and all the pilgrims who have gathered from all over Egypt celebrated the resurrection of Osiris. How common was that kind of story? Because for me, the, the story of death and resurrection of a, of a deity emerges with Christianity. So was it common for people to think this way? Well, in the Nile Valley it was. And uh, in the ancient Near East, you also have uh, the myths of the sacrificed savior gods who died for their people and were resurrected, came back uh, to life and would lead uh, all the righteous souls to salvation and eternal life. Well, what would I have seen if I was here 3,000, 4,000 years ago? During the festival, on that night where they buried Osiris, lights were lit and candles were lit all over Egypt to commemorate his burial. So if you imagine the temple, which is full of light, full of incense, people carrying candles and praying for the God's resurrection, the mystery of it, chanting prayers, uh, for his resurrection. If you imagine incense, uh, candlelight, uh, vigils, it would have been magical. 
Many similar rituals are still carried on today by the Egyptian Coptic Church. Which other elements within this passion play, within this myth, have parallels with Christianity? Well, baptism in the holy river in the Nile, which were considered to be a sacred river, uh, the sacred Nile water, which was carried into the temple and uh, the statues were anointed with it. Linda, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The eating of corn bread as the body of Osiris, because corn, um, came about through the sacrifice of Osiris. So this whole eating of bread and drinking of beer that issued uh, from the risen God uh, is also paralleled by the Eucharist mass in Christianity. So the corn bed and the beer are paralleled today by having the bread and the wine. Exactly. But it's 3,000 years ago. There's a very interesting image in that last room and it consists of the dead Osiris as a mummy placed on a lion bed. His wife Isis hovers over him like a kite, like a bird and at this moment they're engendering the saviour child. So it is uh, the moment that uh, life is being transferred from, from death to life, from father to son. So it's sort of like a miraculous birth. It's a miraculous birth of the saviour child. Wow. These are ideas that we find in the Christian story of Jesus. Did Christianity just steal these ideas from this Egyptian myth? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I would think that Christianity had its own message, a new message, a new philosophy uh, to offer. It simply borrowed these ideas uh, to explain its own message more clearly, to reach a vast amount of people and this is possibly the secret why it spread in Egypt so quickly. So when Paul says I become all things to all people that I can, so that I can win them to Christ, this was an example of that happening where they were using these stories to help explain the Christian story. Yes, I think that's probably right. This is a major revelation because it seems to me you're suggesting that the idea of a saviour God who redeems the world doesn't just begin with modern Europe, doesn't even begin with the ancient Near East. It goes all the way back to the earliest forms of human experience out of Africa. Absolutely, it does. While it may be easy for some Christians to reject any similarities between Jesus and ancient Indian gods thousands of miles away, the Roman god Mithras and the ancient Egyptian cult of Osiris are just too close to home to be dismissed so easily. But what about the historical Jesus, the one who lived and died in Rome and Palestine? If you strip away all the Christian dogma around Jesus, the theology created by Paul and his followers, what are you left with? Jesus the Jew.